of the Gaussian software output. And so, um, and so we're going to go through, what's that? So don't ever print it. Yeah, that's right. Don't ever print these files. So whenever you get your result, your calculation result, um, most of the file is, is just for debug information. I mean, it's just, I don't want to say it's useless, but most of the file is useless. Okay, because you're doing an operation that's iterative. So you're calculating something, changing it, calculating again, changing it, calculating again, changing it. And then in terms of the software, in order to let you know that it's progressing, it produces a lot of output that you don't really need. Okay. And so this, um, it's def definitely something you would never want to print because it would be, you know, tens to hundreds of pages long and all you really need is a few numbers <laughs> okay so uh, you're always going to go pulling through the output file to try to find the information that you need and pulling it out and i'm excited about today's lecture because i've never put all of this stuff into one lecture so some of the things that i've done with uh, uh, pulling information out of these files uh, i'll show you some neat tricks today that uh, you might not have thought of because you're so young. <laughs> okay. And so uh, I'll show you some of those old school tricks on how to pull things out of files and put them in other files. Okay. So we did the Gauss view sort of tour last time, last couple of times. And so this is our calculation setup. And the most, op, uh, most frequent job is this opt plus freak. So it's a geometry optimization and a frequency calculation. And so this is the kind of job that, that optimizes the geometry and, and calculates the frequencies of the molecule, uh, which will tell you at the end if you're in a, at least potentially in a global minimum. You really can't tell if you're in a, in a global minimum. Let me just draw a quick example. Um, so let's do the... Um, Newman projection for dichloroethane. You familiar with this kind of projection for an organic molecule? Yes. <laughs> okay. And so if you have this what is um, what is the um, uh, yeah the dihedral angle? So we'll go from from here from zero to three sixty with one eighty right here in the middle. And so when the chlorines are on top of each other, that's a pretty high you know interaction because they're huge atoms, the electron cloud bumping into the other electron cloud, um, and then. At 180, they're opposite of each other. That's as far away as they can be. So that's probably the global minimum. But every time they go past a hydrogen, they bump over one, too. And so when it gets to 60 degrees, that's going to be a minimum. When it gets to 120 degrees, it's going to be a maximum, but not as high as bumping over a chlorine. And so we have some critical points here like this. And Gaussian is able to map out this potential energy surface. Okay, and so this right here is called a local minimum. And this right here is the global minimum. And we mean global to all of the bond angles, bond lengths, and, and so on uh, in the molecule. So global means of all of the potential structural parameters, this is the minimum energy for all of them. And then in the local minimum, it's still a, a minimum with respect to all the bond links and angles, but it's just not the lowest energy structure. So we have two different possibilities for this molecule, but one possibility is the global minimum, 
two thirds of the molecules may be in these local minima. But the thing, the sad thing about it with Gaussian is Gaussian can't really tell you um, if you're in a local minimum or a global minimum. So even with its optimization procedures, it can get stuck right here in this local minimum. This frequency calculation can tell you if you're right here though, or right here. Because notice this kind of has a, a parabola that goes down. You see that? And because it has a parabola that goes down, your vibrational frequency is below your critical point. And so that means it's a negative vibrational frequency. Now, why might we get stuck on this, this top of this hill if Gaussian's minimizing everything? This is still a minimum with respect to all other coordinates. So like the CH stretch, it's going to be at a minimum for the CH stretch. It's only at a maximum for this dihedral angle. So what we've plotted here is the minimum energy for all other parameters in the molecule, the carbon-carbon chlorine angle, the carbon-carbon hydrogen angles, the CH bond length, the carbon-carbon bond length, the carbon-chlorine bond length, all of those are at a minimum. And just the, the chlorine, carbon, carbon, chlorine dihedral angle is the only one that's, that's at a maximum here. And, and so this one right here is going to show that, that imaginary frequency or a negative vibrational frequency. So new vibe is less than zero. And they're called imaginary frequencies. And essentially it's Again, this is the parabola, it's like an X squared, and this is the imaginary root. This is, neg you know, the X squared equals a negative number, <laughs> okay? And so it's gonna be an imaginary number. So that's where the word imaginary comes from. It, it's a negative root of a square, okay? Um, and so it's um, it's giving you an imaginary frequency, uh, and it's not that it doesn't exist, it's that it's a complex number, it's imaginary. So that's why we don't just do a geometry optimization, we also do the frequency calculation. So we wanna make sure that we're not at the top of a hill. We wanna make sure that we're at least at the bottom of a hill in one of these wells. Now, we can't really know if we're at a local minimum or a global minimum, and that's where your brain comes in. You've got to look at your system and think, are there other dihedral angles I should test? And in some of you, if you're doing work for you know, like Dr. Gross and so on, some of these molecules are pretty big. These benzoxodiboranes, I can't remember the names, but <laughs> they, you know, they, they could have lots of dihedrals. And so you might have to check those other options to make sure that there are, um, you know, if you want to find the global minimum, you got to check all of those. And then you pick the one with the lowest energy and that's the global minimum. So this is why we typically do both of these calculations together. We do an optimization and a frequency calculation. Now, because this is an iterative process, you know, this loops around. We calculate the energy of the geometry. We calculate the change in energy with respect to the geometric co coordinates. And then we calculate, are we at a minimum? And if we're not, we change the geometry and go again. And so that's why we call this iteration. So it, it loops and it produces output for each of those loops. And so that's why most of the output is useless because it's just these, these steps that, that you don't care about. You're just letting the program run and it's putting things out in the text file so that you know it's doing something. So it's just really for human interaction. It could just run in the background and only present, print the results at the end. But think about a, a two hour, three hour or three day calculation 
you have no idea what's going on except the CPU is running at 100 percent, you know. <laughs> and so it's nice for it to give you some information. Every once in a while, it sticks some stuff in a text file and you can look to see where it's at in the program. And then if it dies, you can look at the last line in the text file and say, well, it died here. Why? You know, and sometimes it will put out some error information and be helpful. Yes. Okay. So let's look at this iteration loop. Let's look at the output file, this information that it puts out. So here's, here's how the job starts. So if you look at a log file, it may be kind of small text. I can read it, but I'm right up here. Can you read that in the back? Is it okay? It's You're the farthest away. You can yeah. squint and see it. Is it, I mean, you printed it out too. Is it really tiny in the text? Yeah. Yeah. I should probably hand out magnifying glasses. <clears throat> but anyway, when you look at a log file, and if you're doing Gaussian calculations, your log files are going to pile up quickly. You're going to have a bunch of them. And you need to know quickly when you open it up, what kind of calculation was this? Okay. And so it says up at the top, you know, what kind of calculation was. So this first percent check, that's the checkpoint file designation for this. And then there's the root card telling you uh, telling Gaussian what to do, but it also tells you what kind of calculation this was. Now, this um, the checkpoint file designation was called the percent card. This root card has, starts with a hashtag sign or a, a pound sign, and it is it's fun because this goes back to the old days. They were they called these cards because in the old days that's what they were. They were punch cards. Okay, and you had a punch card that started with the first character as a percent sign because that's not a typical thing that you would type, right? And so it would be percent sign and it would have information about the checkpoint file and where that was going to go. And then you had the root card that started with this pound sign and then you could uh, tell it what kind of calculation to do. And so you go to the computational center with your stack of uh, punch cards that had all the binary bits punched into it and you'd feed them in and that would put the program into the computer and then it would run your program and calculate your results and then it would punch out the the final results into a set of cards and you could go to a card reader that could tell you what those results were yeah so that's 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 older than even i don't remember that i never i never played on a punch card computer but but if you go see uh, like hidden figures uh, but she's working with that IBM. You see the you see punch cards there. You see them talking about the punch cards and so on. Um, my boss had from his computational days in the and he had just stacks of these punch cards lying around, and uh, we would use them to block laser beams or take notes on. It's kind of hard, kind of a crummy notepad because there are a lot of holes in it, <laughs> so you can write in the places where there weren't holes. But but that's where they call this the root card, and so we teach that language still because that's kind of cool. It dates back to the punch card uh, implementation of Gaussian. So when I talk about the root card, that's just what kind of calculation you're doing. And in this case, we see that it's an optimization. We see the opt keyword here. We see freak. It says freak equals Raman. So it's just saying, go ahead and calculate all the frequencies and go ahead and spend a little extra time and calculating the Raman intensities. So that's uh, you could save a few, you know, a few percent in your calculation time if you don't do that. But, uh, but I, I like to have it because I like to have the Raman spectroscopy. Then you should recognize this here. What is that called? Yeah. So here's the level of theory. We're doing a DFT calculation, B3 OIP, and this is the basis set. So that's all in the root card. Then we have all of these bits here. Um, telling Fortran what to do. So these are called links and overlays. So this is actually all of the subroutines that are being called in Fortran. It's a very modular build in terms of Gaussian, and this is telling it which subroutines to run and have all these kinds of switches. You really don't ever have to worry about that. But occasionally, if you um, get into this, you know, at least knee deep, sometimes you have to edit the overlay area. But most of the time you don't. Then we have the title for the calculation. It's not implemented in, there's, there's nothing that depends upon the title. That's just for your information. 
the charge and multiplicity of the molecule, and then the input or initial molecular geometry down here. And this is showing Cartesian coordinates. You can do Cartesian coordinates or you can do the Z matrix. Um, but most of the time, Gauss view handles all of this. And so you don't really have to worry about inputting it yourself. I'm just teaching you how to read the output file. And so this is telling you all of the information about this calculation up front. Uh, it also tells you the initial geometry. So once it reads in these Cartesian coordinates, it's beautiful. I mean, it tells you this is what you started with. And so we did this uh, calculation. This is on methanol. Um, see, it says methanol for PQCW. So this is, um, you know, Okay, but I don't have a, I don't I don't have atom numbers on here, and so it helps sometimes to bring it into um, uh, bring it into Gauss view so that I can see the molecule and I can see the labels of the atoms, like which one is R12, R13, R14, um, or R15. Well, these three here are the same, so they're probably the three CH bonds, and then R1143, 1.43, probably the CO. And then the 0.96 is probably the OH, yeah. And so those are my five bonds that I have here. Then I have all of my angles, and it's putting in the, the initial guess at an sp3 carbon and an sp3 oxygen at my angles of 109.5. And then the dihedrals are the dihedrals between these hydrogens here at 60 and 60, and then the dihedral from uh, like this hydrogen here to that OH. So this, that, that is a 180. So notice a dihedral has four centers associated with it. And so I'm gonna call this one two, one, five, and six. And so it's the dihedral angle between H2, C1, and O5. I'm gonna draw this triangular plane here and this triangular plane here. You know, all you need to define a plane is, is three points. So three points define a plane as long as they're not collinear. And so I've got H, C, O, those are three points, non-collinear, they define a plane. And C, O, H, the other hydrogen, defines a plane. And the dihedral angle is the angle between those planes. So does everybody understand the dihedral? We drew one with this, um, with this uh, right here, this was the CL, C, C, CL, right? The three, the three points defining the plane were the carbon, carbon, and chlorine and then the carbon, carbon, and this chlorine. And the dihedral angle was the angle between those planes. And the way you can see that angle between the planes is to look down the carbon, carbon bond. And so that's why we draw this, this Newman projection. So we can look down, there's a plane here defined by the two carbons and the chlorine. And there's a plane here defined by the two carbons and the chlorine. And we're looking at the angle between those planes. Does everybody understand what a dihedral angle is? Okay, so that's what's being shown here with this methanol, and that's what's in this output. Okay, now what about the carbon-hydrogen dihedral angles? Well, it's the OCH defines a plane, and then OC and a different H defines the other plane. And so this is just that that uh, um, the hydrogens how they're making up that methyl group. So you have the angles down from the oxygen, like this angle right here, that might be one of these here, the 109.5 say, you know, is the angle down from the oxygen, but then the dihedral angles tell you how these hydrogens are distributed around that axis. Okay. So anyway, we're just kind of explaining some of the, some of the output that we see over here. Any questions about the output so far? Okay. So let's look at some of the iteration results. 
So it starts the calculation and it starts to print out these results, these in interim results. And there's a distance matrix. That's the first thing that it calculates. And that's the distance from every atom to every other atom in the molecule. And that's necessary for those potentials in the Hamiltonian. So remember, the, the Hamiltonian has all these Coulombic potentials in it. You know, the repulsion of this nucleus from that nucleus. Well, I got to calculate the R12, the distance between this nucleus and every other nucleus. So the first thing it does is calculate a distance matrix. It also looks to see if it can use symmetry to simplify things. And Gaussian is very picky in terms of its symmetry cutoffs. And so it's telling us this molecule is C1 when it's really not, okay? Um, the way it was constructed, it was at least CS. So we had, again, this H, C, H, H, O, H. It has a mirror plane. You see the mirror plane? So it's CS, but this one of those angles or one of those bond lengths must not have been exactly the same or the, the dihedral definitions, like instead of 60, it was like 59.99999. Yeah. And so it's not CS. It says there's no mirror plane. So it's really tight. So if you want to get an accurate symmetry, you go into Gauss view and you can, you can force it to be CS. But if you do that, sometimes you create a situation where it's going to be not at a global minimum. It'll only look for geometry optimizations that maintain CS symmetry. So you got to be sure that the minimum you're seeking has that symmetry. Otherwise, you're constraining the calculation. So this is an unconstrained calculation because it's a C1 point group. And we'll get into the symmetry. That's part of this course uh, um, in the middle part of the course. And we'll see that the C1 point group only has one symmetry element, and that's identity. So essentially it has no symmetry. So it's treating this molecule totally open, totally free, without any symmetry. And it's telling you that right here with the point group of C1. And then down here we have some information about the basis sets. So it's telling us the 6-31G with the polarization functions on the heavy atoms. It's got all kinds of symmetry adapted Cartesian basis functions and so on. So this is telling you, you know, the, the total number of basis functions, 38 basis functions of 72 primitive Gaussians and so on. You don't really need this information. I'm just kind of pointing it out that it's a way to sort of track your calculation in terms of basis sets. If you want to compare um, results by just the sheer number of basis sets, you could use some of these numbers. Then we have um, the energy. Let me go ahead and erase some of my markings here. So this, this uh, term SCF done, that SCF is sort of the solution of that Hamiltonian. It's called self self-consistent field. It's got coefficients in front of all of these wave functions and it's it's iterating the coefficients and calculating the energy and when the energy stops changing based on those coefficients then it's found a, a good uh, mixing of all of those atomic orbitals and, and so on. And so it, it reaches that self-consistent field and it produces the energy of that particular geometry. And so that's the energy relative to fully separated nuclei and electrons. So that's important too. And this energy is in Hartree's. Now think about that, relative to fully separated nuclei and electrons. And so if you take all the nuclei apart and all the electrons to infinite distance, then all of those potential terms go to zero. Um, and, and so then uh, when you bring them together, those attractive potentials, you got negative particles and positive particles coming together, all of your energies are gonna be negative relative to zero. Zero is everything pulled apart. And so all of your, all of your energies that you calculate are gonna be negative. The more atoms that you add, you bring in more electrons, you bring in more things that are gonna be attracted to each other, you're gonna get further and further negative. And so we're just, 
calculating, if we want to later on calculate differences, we've got the differences between negative numbers and it can be confusing. You can mess up the signs quite often, but a lot of times, uh, you know, you, you just got to get used to seeing all these really negative energies. And a heart tree is quite a bit of energy. Uh, one heart tree, I think it's one heart tree is equal to about 26, 25.5, I think, like kilojoules per mole. Hmm. Yeah. So if you had a mole of these molecules, it would be, you know, that negative 115 <coughs> times 2,600 negative. So that's how much energy you get by bringing all of those electrons and all those nuclei together to make this molecule. It would release that much energy. So it makes sense. All those electrons, even the 1s electrons pulled away from the from the carbon, which has, you know, so you're pulling away, you're pulling a lot of energy, it's the 100% ionization <laughs> energy that makes sense, yeah. Here's the symmetries of the molecular orbitals. Because we're in a C1 point group, they're all A, there's only one symmetry element, A, <laughs> okay. It's not A1 or A2 or A prime or anything, it's just A. Um, and so there's really not much. But if you had like benzene, there would be A, A, you know, 1G and A2U and E2G and T2G and all of those kinds of things. So you, you know, octahedral system, you would see those kinds of symmetries of the molecular orbitals. Here are the orbitals of the of those energies of those molecular orbitals, and you can see here they're negative, and this is called occupied here occupied eigenvalues and so these are the occupied orbital energies and this one right here is the energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital and these are the unoccupied orbitals and this is the lumo here How do you doing? Oh, never mind, never mind. yeah so it's positive yeah so the positive ones so right there at that break the negative ones are negative because we've got an attraction you know you know, we've got a, a negative energy compared to pulling all of the things apart. And then the positive ones are so, somewhat antibonding, right? You're putting electrons in something that's taking away energy from the molecule and weakening the bonds. Now, it says condensed to atoms, all electrons. I don't understand how, the, I don't understand that output part. So I, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't understand. So I'm just giving you a rundown on the things that I do understand. Here are the charges, the Millikan charges on the atoms. And this is similar to formal charges. So you know how you, you do formal charges in a, like, um, like sulfuric acid, right? Or sulfate. Like you would do formal charges here, sulfur comes in with six valence electrons and it's sharing six electrons, so it has a formal charge of zero. Whereas this oxygen comes in with six valence electrons, but it's sharing seven, so it's a minus one. So this is kind of like the formal charge is huge. <laughs> We're putting a whole minus one on that oxygen, but here it's showing this oxygen is a minus 0. 0.6 and this hydrogen is a plus 0.39. You know, and these hydrogens are not very charged at all, and the carbon is not very charged. Okay, so this is Millikan charges, and so you can sometimes pull some information out of the charges, but they're not very reliable. Uh, it just kind of depends. Sometimes your research hits on them, and they and they they can tell you something, but um, yeah, I haven't I haven't found them to be very useful. But that's kind of what. They're there in case they are useful. Okay. Is it second where you are actually like partial positive? Partial yeah, partial positive, positive partial, partial negative. Okay. Yeah, so you can see this is definitely, you know, oxygen's got quite a bit of electron density around it. And, and this hydrogen's really exposed. It's positive 0.39. Yeah, so that's, that, that's why it's acidic, somewhat acidic. Yeah, and it's exposed. So, you know, a, a base could come along and steal that hydrogen away from methanol. Yeah, where it's not going to steal these because you look at them, they're not very positive. Right. So they're pretty enveloped in, in electrons, and so they, they just doesn't have an exposed nucleus. Okay. Um, this is 
just the non-hydrogen atoms, who knows why that's put output, but it's there, you know. Um, this is the dipole moment for the molecule. So sometimes we want to talk about dipole moments in molecules. And so this is the net dipole moment. Uh, then you have all these multipole moments, which I've never found a use for, but you know, these are the quadrupole moments and the traceless quadrupole <laughs> moment. Who the heck knows? The octopole moment. It's great stuff, but I, I don't know. I don't know what to use that with. And so then we get to cri convergence criteria because we're going to loop through this until we converge. So let's talk about what converge means. You know, we get down here to this question is, are you at a minimum? Well, how do we know if we're at a minimum? Well, these are the four ways we know. Okay. So it can calculate the force on all the atoms. So if, if I'm up on a hill, like uh, for my... My dichloro, um, so if I'm very close to that chlorine with, a, with an angle of like 10 degrees, right, then there's going to be a pretty big force on that atom pushing it away. And so that's the maximum force. Now, it might calculate the maximum force on the, on the hydrogens and the carbons and everything, and those may be small but the chlorines are really the ones that are bumping. So they're going to pick the maximum force in the whole molecule and report it. So this is the value. I don't know the units. Okay. And then the RMS, let's say there's really not a particular atom that's experiencing much force, but all of the atoms have some force. So the root mean squared. So it, it, they, they square all of the forces so that the negatives don't cancel the positives. They add them together and then they take the square root. So that's the RMS force and that's this one. So this is sort of the average force and the maximum force. And there's a threshold value. It's going to say it's at a minimum when the maximum force is below 450 in the sixth place. And when the RMS, the average force is below 300. So it's got criteria. And so you check the maximum force and the RMS force and compare it to your criteria. And if it's greater than, then you haven't converged yet. Uh, how does it calculate the threshold? That's the input in. It's what it defines as a minimum. And so you can you can make that, I think it's uh, loose, medium, and tight, I guess. But by default, it's medium. Okay. So you can tighten it down. Uh, it just makes your calculation take longer. So I haven't ever had a need to tighten this, but you can tighten it. So. Does that mean no matter, no matter the molecule, a medium threshold is going to be that? Yes, okay. I believe so. They may scale with the molecule. I've never compared two different molecules for their convergence criteria, but okay. yeah. It, it may square or scale because if you have more atoms, the That's, RMS force might need to be bigger. But, but, um, but there's some internal method for coming up with that number. Okay. So, so we're coming down you know, in this minimum so let's say we're walking down trying to find this minimum right here. The minimum is a single point, but this threshold is going to create like a an area where all of this is okay. Okay, and so if we're way up here, we have a maximum force and an RMS force that's pushing us downhill. Yeah, so a loose would be higher. Yeah, and we're saying we're good, you know, close enough, right? And then uh, maximum displacement. So again, how it's going to calculate the next. So here we see this up here. Uh, old X. This is kind of the, the, the gradient. And this is the, um, the new X. And so it's comparing, you know, this is going to jump from 2.02 .02 to 2.06. So it's calculating where it's going to go. So that's what it means by displacement. How far are we going to push this chlorine in the next step? And so it's it's calculating this this next step at displacement. And and so it has a maximum. So the biggest one in the whole molecule is 0 0.08 angstroms. I think these are angstroms. And and it's it's too big. It's like it's calculating a huge jump, so we're not in the minimum yet. And then uh, it's also doing the, the average jump. And the average jump for all of the molecules adds up to this number, RMS value. And it's also not below the threshold. So all four of our criterion are no, because we're not inside this window of okay. 
Now, in a rare situation, you have a calculation that won't stop. It'll go 99 cycles and die because at 99 cycles, Gaussian says, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Let's go ahead and kill the calculation and have the person interact with it and look at it. And and it's pretty rare, but sometimes the 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 molecule is right here and it calculates its displacement and everything and it jumps to the other side of the well. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and so then uh, it does the gradient and everything. And then all the calculations say go back and it calculates how far to go back. And it jumps to the other side of the well. <laughs> and it does that 99 times. <laughs> and so that's uh, <clears throat> that's just I've had it happen to me once in 20 years, you know, <laughs> so probably not going to happen to you. But um you know, you look at it and you, you can go to these convergence criteria and you can see like it'll be yes, yes, no, no. And then, you know, it'll be the same number, you know, over and over again. And you're like, oh, I see what's going on. Um, and so I, I just like bumped the bumped the geometry a little bit and started again. And it was enough to kind of create chaos in the in the in the deal. And so one one atom was on a different, you know, jump scheduled than the others and it was able to get inside the window so, so a lot of times that's all the solution is to start with another initial guess and and start the calculation again you would think they would put a thing that said if this value and this value yeah. are the same change the step by half order. yeah yeah there's a lot of stuff in there this is a pretty rare thing but i just it was curious that this is the criterion and it's all it's kind of fun Okay, so old school tricks. Let's look at this iteration. How many times did it did it iterate? Well, let's look that up. So this is an old school MS DOS and command prompt. You guys ever heard of that? Yeah. Microsoft yeah. DOS. Yeah. DOS. Do you know what DOS stands for? Drug uh, operating system. No, it was disk operating system, um, and then uh, it, the original was QDOS, and uh, and uh, um, Bill Gates. Uh, was like writing it on the plane to 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 the meeting where they were gonna like supply the first sort of PC type computing architecture and it was Q Q DOS and it was quick and dirty operating system. <laughs> <laughs> so he was writing it on the plane as he was going to the meeting where they were gonna license the software uh, and start Microsoft. So that was pretty cool. So uh, the same old commands still work from the 1970s. Um, so you can open this thing called command prompt. You just do the Windows key and type in CMD and you'll get this black window with the command prompt. And like for my computer, it put me on the S drive. That's my campus drive. So I just type in C colon. So I type that in and it moved me to the C drive where Gaussian's installed. And then I type in CD for change directory. and type in the name of the directory, G16W, so that puts me in the G16W, and now you can see that, that I'm in that folder. We call them folders now. In the old days, they called them directories. It kind of goes back to the old days, the, like the first use for computers was saving um, directory information, people's names, addresses, phone numbers for sales, right? So that was one of the first sort of the apps was to help people keep track of their contacts. And so all of these folders were called directories in you know, different directories. Well, now they're folders. So then a scratch, a change directory to the scratch directory. And so now I'm here and then I run this program SCF done dot bat on my log file. And then I write it into a new text file. So let's look at this program here. This is this program that I wrote. It's called a dot bat, which is an executable file in the command prompt. It's called a batch file and it's just text. And so this has some familiar things. How many people do control F to search through a file? This is it right here. Find. So that command in a batch file in command prompt will search through a file and find keywords. And so I have it find the root card. I have it look for that pound sign. 
and I take it out of file number one and put it into file number two using those percent signs. Then I find CPU job time, and then I find SCF done. That's really why I wanted to do this part is because I wanted to see how many iterations it has. And then I do a thing called more, which just puts displays it on the screen. And so this is what I get. So from this command, SCF done dot bat, and I put my, my uh, file names in, in quotes, and then this is the output. And it gives me the root card. It tells me what kind of calculation it was. It tells me how long the calculation took. And then it tells me this is the iterations that it went through. So it went through six iterations until it finished. So that would just did that just to show you that the iterative process. Let's look at, um, once we're done, look, here's our convergence criteria. So we got down well below our thresholds. And so then we're at a minimum, so yes. And then here's our output. Notice our, our bond lengths have changed a little bit. My hydrogens are no longer perfectly symmetric. Um, here's my angles and so on. So this is the optimized geometry. So if you're looking for particular bond lengths, this is where you would find it. Uh, the convergence criteria were good. Um, and then this is some, sometimes the greatest thing you'll ever see after two or three days of calculation. It says normal termination of Gaussian 16. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you go in, you look at the last part of that file, and it says normal termination. This can also tell you that this log file contains a, a calculation that ended without error. Okay. Um, this is a root card for the next job. In this case, it's a frequency calculation. And this is an archive entry for some places. They, they have a database of all the calculations done. So now for the frequency calculation. So we take this optimized geometry, we run it into the frequency calculation, calculate the frequencies, check for negative frequencies. If there are, we reduce the symmetry. If they're not, we've got the optimized geometry. So this is our calculation output. We have the vibrational modes one through three n minus six. So they're numbered from low frequency up to high frequency. This is the symmetry of the vibrational motion. So again, if you have benzene or something that's symmet got a you know um, highly symmetric point group, you'll have A1G, A2U, and so on. Uh, the vibrational frequency and wave numbers, the infrared intensities, the Raman intensities, um, and then this is the vibrational mode atomic displacements. So you have those arrows that we draw on the atoms. These are the arrows, the directions of those arrows. So you have an arrow that's going, you know, down and up in X and down in Y, um, you know, and so on. We have all of these different displacements. This, this, you can just look at this and tell that this motion is really not involving the Z axis. So this motion is in the X, Y plane, whereas this motion is, is quite a bit in the z-axis and has a little bit in the x-plane. Uh, check the lowest frequencies for imaginary numbers, or not imaginary, but negative numbers. So the negative uh, results of that um, potential would be an imaginary frequency. And if you find that, that means you're at the top of one of those coordinates. To figure out which one, you can go into gauss and animate this motion. Um, Here's how you pull those frequencies out of, so here's the simplest program. Find frequencies in file number one and output it to file number two. Find Raman activities and output to number two. Find IR intensities and output to number two. So this is, saves a lot of time if you're gonna put these in Excel for, otherwise you have to go in and select every one of those little numbers and paste it into Excel. Three and minus six times times two because you want the frequency and the intensity. And look, there's three N minus six of these. This is methanol. So how many atoms in methanol? Three hydrogens, carbon, oxygen, and a hydrogen. So that's six. Three times six is 18. Minus six is 12. And here's 12 vibrational frequencies. Okay. And then the thermochemistry output is important. We're not really going to talk about thermochemistry in this course too much. But this is the uh, default temperature and pressure. You could change those in the input file. The default isotopes. You have rotational information. And then down here at the bottom, the enthalpy and the Gibbs energy. So if you're going to see if a reaction was exothermic, 
You calculate the reactants, calculate the products, take the difference. Be sure to incorporate the number of moles of each. Same with the Gibbs energy. And then this Gauss view display format, you can take Gauss view, you right click the background and click display format here. And then you have all of these options. You can turn on the labels of the atoms. And so here you can see that R56 was that OH bond. So these numbers are going to correspond to the numbers in that output file. And then uh, you could show the symbols. You can show the Cartesian axes. You see the Z axis coming out at us. So this would be X over here and this is Y up here. You could even do something like a space filling. So under the molecule tab, you could increase the radius and make a space filling model. Um, you can also go up to results and click vibrations. And you see the three N minus six vibrations here. If you click on one of the vibrations and hit start animation, this is what you get. So it's really cool. Gauss view is so nice because you can go in and animate every one of the vibrations and see what it looks like. So if you had a negative frequency, go in and see which dihedral it is and see why it's a, you know at the top of the hill. What you want to do then is just kick the molecule in that direction off the top of that hill and resubmit the calculation. And then it'll, it'll find a, a minimum. It may be a local minimum, but it'll at least find a minimum. And then if you click this spectrum down here at the bottom, then you get the, the spectrum. And this little red arrow will tell you what peak corresponds to this vibration. And so this is showing you, this is the OH stretch at, at 3750 wave numbers. Um, these little green or little blue bars are active. So with the mouse, if you were to click this, then you would get one of these CH stretches over here. If you were to click, you know, one of these right here, you probably get this, the wagging motion of the hydrogens. Click this right here, this thousand, it's going to be the carbon oxygen bond length. Okay, and so you're gonna, you could click the frequency somewhere here and you could get the vibration and see it animated. Same thing with the Raman. So this would be the Raman intensity for this motion. And this is the IR intensity for this motion. And specifically for, for symmetric molecules, the Raman intensity typically is, is tall when the IR intensity is small and vice versa. For an asymmetric molecule like this, it's not exactly that, but you still see some of it. Like this is a small change in dipole moment and a small um, uh, peak in the IR, but a big peak in the Raman. And down here, vice versa, here's kind of a small peak in the Raman and a big peak in the IR. So that's a tour of the, the Gaussian output and a little bit about Gauss view. Any questions? We've got a couple of minutes. We will implement these little MS-DOS programs. So if you don't know quite how to do this just yet, don't worry, we will we'll get to it. We, we will use that. Okay, next time what we have to look forward to. So next time we'll go over, uh, this was Gaussian calculating a spectrum. I want to go back to the particle in a box just to kind of show you the numerical way of doing it um, from the wave function all the way through the spectrum. And so that's what we'll be doing next time in Excel. Um, is doing uh, sort of a, a walkthrough of how uh, the spectrum is simulated um, in Excel. And then on Monday, we'll do a spectrum simulation worksheet where we can take the Gaussian output and create a simulated spectrum very much like uh, was shown here. So you'll be able to produce this in Excel from a Gaussian output and incorporate your experimental spectra. Now you might ask, if Gaussian produces this spectrum, why do I need to do it myself? Well, Gaussian can't take your experimental spectrum and put them on top with your th simulated spectrum. You have to do that. And so we need to take the Gaussian output in terms of frequencies and intensities, put them in Excel so that we can match them to our ex experimental data. All right, well, I'll see you next time.